Hello everyone, I'm Brian and today I'm going to be doing a reaction to Swami Sarvapriyananda replies to questions of Robert Bernstein. So this was a request, so do a request, if you have a request, please leave the title, the YouTube channel, and the link, that way I can find it. You can put, you can put the direct link if you want, but there's a chance that it might get uh, held, for, held for review as YouTube does it. And always just go and get started. Uh, Robert, go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, so in your talk, you, you said that I don't create Manhattan. So I'm interested in this question of how, how, how this witness relates to physical reality. They, they have to interact in some way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, that's the thing I'm also wondering as well is uh, is what's the benefit of knowing the Turia? What and I, I've thought of maybe maybe the fact that we can separate ourselves from our emotions. Uh, that kind of sounds terrible, uh, at least from my understanding. It's okay to feel things. It lets you know. Let you know something. <laughs> But yeah, that's that's one of the questions. Is, is um, not necessarily how it relates. What it's weird to say. What be, how does it benefit us? As though as we're looking for a monetary reason or or something. Well, to me, I guess I'm I'm highly practical. Maybe I don't know. Um, but in order for me to to pursue something. I guess there must, there has to be a very good reason, and not necessarily as a way to benefit me, because it all depends on what I'm pursuing. Like for me to help a friend, uh, I guess there's going to be always a benefit because you'll you get, you'll deepen the relationship with your friend. Um, I'm not necessarily looking for a monetary reason, but it it also helps out someone that you care about. But since this is just for me and me alone, in a sense. Obviously, I, I can help other people get to this, but what does it do for them if it doesn't ease their pain or, or something? You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like understanding um, <laughs> that freaking pen. <laughs> this writes, I could go down to the me molecular level and find out what everything is composed of, but it won't do me any good. I mean, I could find out that though the material is plastic, there's ink in there, and there's I don't know what the heck that yellow thing is. That, that's above the ink. It helps push the ink down, I guess. It looks like glue. I touched it. It's very liquidy. I am fascinated by it, kind of, a little bit. But anyways, like, you know, knowing all this stuff doesn't really help me in any way. I, I know that it's made out of plastic. I know there's ink. I know there's that that weird yellow substance on top of the, the, the ink. And knowing all of it, the molecular structure of it, it doesn't really benefit me in any way. So... While I'm still, I still want to understand it, obviously, because maybe understanding will help me find a way to, if there's a benefit to it, to teach other people, to teach other people, uh, hopefully inform other people of it. I don't know how how to say that. Um, <laughs> God, I said a lot. Does this have any physical consequence at all? What What is the nature of reality? Right. Let me give you the answer in um, one proposition, and then I'll, I'll uh, expand it if necessary. Um, it is that that re that alone. The let's not call it the witness. Let's just call it consciousness or being consciousness, which appears as reality. What we call reality. So that would be reality, and what we are experiencing as reality is an appearance of that reality. Now, a good way of understanding this would be our dream paradigm again. Um, in our dream paradigm, suppose I'm walking around in Manhattan. Uh, I, the guy walking around in Manhattan, in the dream, I don't know I'm dreaming. I, the guy walking around in Manhattan, I'm actually not creating Manhattan. It's I, the dreamer, who's safely in, in bed and who's dreaming in this entire thing, is the one who's creating Manhattan in the dream and also the subject, the you know, the person walking around in Manhattan in the dream. To put it in more philosophical terms, it's not subjective idealism 
in uh, like Berkeley would have it. It's not that the mind imagining matter. Rather, both mind and matter are appearances in one, you know, like field of existence consciousness, let's say. So the subject and the object are both appearing. It's not that the object is imagined by the subject. Uh, it, that would be subjective idealism. That would be like, you know, um, like Berkeley or in ancient India, the Vigyanavada Buddhists who admitted to mind only without, uh, you know, like matter is in mind. But Advaita mm. Vedanta is not like that. In okay, so that is where I'm at. I guess it's uh, the Buddhist. Uh, let me go back real quick what he says. They say specific Buddhist. How about me? Okay. Like you know, um, like Berkeley or in ancient India, the Vigyanavada Buddhists. Who oh, that sounds like me. <laughs> well, not me, but it sounds like the way I'm thinking at the moment. <clears throat> Again, I'm still very much open to the one question that he had, which was, it's very difficult for me. Very difficult to think about, explain, I guess, is that I, I don't really have an answer to yet, <laughs> which is that which you can experience is not you. And I'm so far, yes, that is true. Can you experience yourself? That is a difficult question. But so far, I'm in, in that sense, uh, that kind of Buddhist. I guess that's a very specific, uh, particular set of Buddhists. Admitted to mind only without, uh, in like matter is in mind. But mm -hmm. Advaita Vedanta is not like that. In fact, the classical Advaitins go to a uh, great extent to distinguish themselves from the Vijnana or the idealists. Uh, that so, so much so that some of Shankara's uh, arguments seem like an argument for uh, realism, that there is a world apart from the subject. Because what he wants to show is the subject and the object are appearances of one existence consciousness. Well, I, I mean, I guess, does, does your view have any cash value as sort of like... When I when I when I ever say that, is there any value to something? It's never just cash value or monetary value. The value in something can be something to help someone. Also, like if they're in trouble or they're they're in anguish or something. If I can, if I have some type of knowledge that could hopefully ease their mind, I would gladly share it <laughs> free. Because <laughs> what I've obtained, uh, I gotten for free. Hopefully, <laughs> for the most part, or learned the hard way or the easy way. But I never think of cash value uh, of these things. It's more along the lines of again, you know, if I if I hear someone struggling and I, I remember a story or someone said that they they did this and helped them out, I, I be, now I can use that knowledge to help someone else, potentially help someone else out. But knowing oneself, that can only affect me as far as I can tell. But what will it do? Because I, again, I have maybe maybe those two blimps of instances. Maybe that's what that was it. It was very common for sure, and and maybe that is good enough to like if people are are stressing out, which is, seems to be quite widespread. That finding one true self will help them calm down. Hopefully, I, I don't know. It if it's so difficult, I don't know if there's going to be a lot of people who would invest that much time into it. Just like. In terms of physics, is there anything, yeah? Oh, well, multiple things. For example, I don't know about, I mean, I'm not directly, you'll have to do that work of re relating it to physics, how you, it would relate. I don't, I'm very far from understanding uh, physics, but uh, it, to me, it seems um, there are multiple things which are, uh, which become easily explainable or much easier when you accept the Advaitic perspective. For example, um, the first person experience. Why is it that we are unable to explain first-person experience from uh, any kind of scientific perspective so far? I mean, in principle, there seems to be no way into it now. So Advaita Vedanta would say, because it is fundamental, consciousness is fundamental, that's what it does. It gives you a first-person experience in conjunction with um, object. When consciousness comes in contact with object, it gets a first-person experience. One philosopher, Professor Arindam Chakravarti, put it rather wittily. He said, you know, what is object? Imagine this field of 
consciousness, unlimited consciousness. An object is something that objects to consciousness. And so we end up seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, <laughs> touching, you know. Uh, so this is, these are entities which sort of object to consciousness. But from an Advaitic perspective, they are all arisings in consciousness itself. So first person experience, the cash value, first person experience. Second, in panpsychism, in um, subjective idealism, in Sankhya philosophy, in all of these, anywhere you have a tinge of dualism, you are faced with the problem of interaction, which is what Descartes, for example, he ended up with, you know, talking, there was this lady who was a very clever, she was a princess uh, who wrote to Descartes, you know, asking him how this, uh, uh, the, uh, this mind, uh, you know, which is, uh, how does it get in touch with the body? So he would go through the pineal gland sometimes, he talked about airs being pushed around by thought and so on. So that just that shows how mind-body dualism, any kind of dualism runs into a problem of uh, interaction. Advaitic ap approach is non-dual, so it actually solves the problem of interaction because the consciousness which is aware of the object, which interacts with the mind and the body and the senses, but the mind, body, senses and the objects they reveal are nothing but that consciousness. Consciousness is appearing as its own, own object, just like a dream. For example, a dream is pretty non-dual because everything that you see in the dream and the person who is seeing in the dream, all of them are the same reality, which is the dreamer's mind. That is such a weird concept. That is very, very difficult concept. I mean, not difficult, hard to believe concept, I will say. To say that, I'm assuming that all the objects in this room and everywhere is me. Now, and that goes back to the egg video too, where not, it doesn't say the objects in the room, but every person is me throughout the entire history of time. That's right, me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that is a that is a very difficult concept to grasp. I'm trying to, I mean, the dream does make sense because it's all happening in your mind, which everything you're viewing in real life is happening in your mind too, because uh, not to go scientific, because I am definitely not scientific. Every everything that you see is just uh, photons of light, and your eyes gets the input of those lights, and then it gets tr it gets transmitted to your brain, and your brain formulates what it sees. At least the particular pattern of light gets transmitted in a way that your brain understands it. So when we see red, it's because a particular hue of red is painted and mind you, that particular hue of red may be a little bit different red from everyone else too. Because of how we interpret it. And uh, what is it? The, 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 is it the shirt and then the shoes? There was an example where people saw blue and gray or white and yellow. And then Yanni and Laurel, some people hear one or the other. That stuff is quite fascinating. From the dreamer's pers mind's perspective, every content of the dream is non-dual. That is, it has no separate existence from the dreaming mind. Similarly, from this being consciousness, um, because Vedanta will always use these terms as existence awareness. Uh, this existence awareness is non-dual. So the mind which experiences and what it experiences, both are ultimately the same reality. Hence, in principle, there is no problem of interaction. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just ended so abruptly. I was expecting a little bit more. Oh, geez, that's just one questions. One, one, one question, one question, not with questions. Okay, so I was a bit confused about the duality and the non-duality. Now he kind of clarified that. So duality basically meaning that the mind-body is separate from what the mind-body experiences. I'm not sure where the boundary is for the duality, whether the mind itself is one and then the body and everything else is the experience or whether the mind-body itself. I think he clarified it. I might have missed it. I'm sure I did. <laughs> But uh, and then the singularity, where it's basically everything is you, I think, if I understood it correctly. And if everything is you, well, everything is you. <laughs> that that is very interesting. Um, I, I I can't remember how Swami here uh, his teaching is it duality or non-duality. 
I definitely want. I would love to hear both perspectives on uh, what is how how singularity. I don't know what the word is. Non-duality. How life is perceived through that. That's very fascinating. And du duality, which is something. I, I'm assuming it's well very common where everyone assumes that at least the mind or the body is separate from everything else and I would still like to hear the perspectives of that and then those monks actually got to go back and write that down and look them up anyways that's my reaction to Swami replies to questions of Robert Bernstein if you like my content please consider subscribing thumbs up thumbs down down below thanks for watching I'll see you in the next vid